my name is Yvonne Lay, and I recently graduated from the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, and next year I'll be attending Columbia University. So today I'm going to talk to you about the research that I did this summer regarding a genetic basis for obesity. So why do we care about obesity so much? In the past 30 years or so, the rate of obesity in America has been rising steadily, with approximately one-third of Americans being obese in 2008. And what comes with obesity is a huge number of health risks, including type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, high blood pressure, cancer, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, and stroke. In 2005, we spent approximately $190 billion on obesity-related health care. So even for people that are not obese, they're still paying for the health care for people that are obese. So next, just to understand how obesity works, we have to understand a concept of energy homeostasis. So in a healthy individual, energy intake and energy expenditure should be balanced. But for people that are obese, energy intake greatly outweighs energy expenditure. So what are the causes behind obesity? Well, first of all, there is environmental causes. So what you eat, if you eat a diet high in fats, then you're mo more prone to becoming obese. But then there's also the genetic factor behind obesity. Obesity is highly heritable, and that makes it really interesting for us as researchers to understand what exactly is going on with the genetics with obesity. So what's already known about the genetics behind obesity? Um, first of all, there is one gene that has been identified as a so-called fat gene. This gene is called FTO, and through human studies and um, running large numbers of genome-wide association studies, they've identified a strong correlation between FTO and obesity. So a lot of researchers have done studies on FTO. Um, Fisher et al. in 2009 did a study about FTO knockout, and they found that FTO knockout protects from obesity. And in the popular press, there have been so, so much coverage about um, FTO and its new role as the fat gene. However, just this year, in 2014, um, studies have shown that maybe it's not FTO that is the fat gene, but rather the gene next door. So these variants within FTO that have been identified to be correlated with obesity have been shown to interact with this gene that's half a megabase downstream called IRX3. Um, this study knocked out IRX3 in mice, as you can see by the um, image with the red circle. These are IRX3 knockout mice, and what happens with these mice is that they don't have increased body weight when fed a high-fat diet. So even when they're given a lot of high, uh, diet high in fats, they don't, lead, they don't develop glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, or increased body weight. So what this indicates is that IRX3 could be an important determinant of body mass and composition. So a little bit more information about IRX3. Um, IRX3 is a transcription factor. So what that means is that it's a protein that binds to specific DNA sequences and controls the rate of making messenger RNA from a DNA template. And what this also indicates is that there's something downstream of IRX3. IRX3 expression has been found in the hypothalamus and the pancreas, which interact with each other in this thing called the gut-brain axis. So the gut-brain axis involves bi-directional communication between the gut and the brain, and it influences a lot of really important bodily functions, including the regulation of food intake and energy homeostasis. So for my study, um, what I'd like to do is build on previous knowledge that introns of FTO are influencing the expression of IRX3, but also understanding what, what's regulating IRX3 and also, more importantly for me, um, what is downstream of IRX3 and how exactly do these downstream targets affect obesity. So in order to do this, um, I worked on this data set that was collected by Alan Addy's lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. and this data set of mice includes an F2 cross between BTBR and BLAK6 mice. And what these mice have is a leptin mutation, which means that these mice don't produce leptin. 
So what's leptin? Leptin is a satiety hormone. It tells your brain when you're full and when you should stop eating. So since these mice don't have this hormone, they continuously eat and as a result gain lots of weight and become obese. So in my data set, I have data on 519 mice, 144 clinical phenotypes, and gene expression traits for 16,677 genes for each of these mice. And um, all of this is found in six different tissues, the hypothalamus, islet, liver, kidney, adipose, and gastrocnemius. So I started off by running genome scans of this gene of interest, IRX3, in these two different tissues that I was particularly interested in just based on literature review, the islet, which is the pancreas, and um, hypothalamus. So looking at the hypothalamus, um, the red line shows a significant um, threshold for these peaks on these different chromosomes, which is shown on the x-axis. Um, so in the hypothalamus, IRX3 expression does not exceed the threshold on any of the chromosomes. So it's not as interesting to look at. But then when I look at in the islet tissue, there's a pretty big peak on chromosome 12 as well as on chromosome 13. So what this meant was I started to direct my attention towards islet tissue and pancreatic IRX3 expression. So just based on what I already know, um, based on this scan, chromosome 12 and chromosome 13 in the pancreas are having an effect on IRX3. So next, what I did was I ran IRX3 expression against all 144 phenotypes in my data set just to see what's correlated with, what's related to. And these four phenotypes popped up as being the most correlated with IRX3. Um, these phenotypes are HOMA, that 10 weeks, which is a measure of insulin and glucose divided by 22.5, insulin at 10 weeks, insulin.rbm, which is just another measure of insulin um, in different units, micro-international units per milliliter, and pepins.10 week, which is um, C peptides per insulin. So um, what's really interesting about all four of these phenotypes is that they're related to insulin. And this isn't really surprising because we are looking at the pancreas tissue and insulin is secreted from the pancreas. So next, um, looking at the effect between these phenotypes and IRX3. So if we look at chromosome 12 for all four of these phenotypes, which is the top row in each of these figures, um, chromosome 12 has a peak that is above the significance threshold. But then when I condition on the expression of IRX3, which means to account for the expression of IRX3, um, you can see that the peak on chromosome 12 decreases below significance level for each of these phenotypes. So what this means is that IRX3 is affecting all the insulin phenotypes. So next I wanted to understand what exactly are the other genes that are um, also related with these four phenotypes as well as IRX3 expression. So I generated this scatter plot matrix. So just to walk you through what this means, um, I'm looking at seven different variables which are highlighted in red. And in the bottom left corner, um, these are the scatter plots between each set of um, variables. So let's say, let's say this one in the top is a is the scatter plot for IRX3 expression and insulin levels at 10 weeks. And up here in the right, all of these um, are the correlation values between each set of variables. So up here would be the um, correlation value between IRX3 expression and insulin levels at 10 weeks. So I actually identified two genes, PPY and PYY, which are highly correlated with all of these phenotypes as well as IRX3 expression. And what was really interesting about these two genes is that they both code for appetite regulating hormones. These two genes, PPY and PYY, are shown here. And um, these are just the correlations with IRX3 expression and the other insulin phenotypes. And as you can see, they're all pretty high. So a little bit more background about what PPY and PYY are. So both of them are part of the neuropeptide Y, NPY family. Um, PPY encodes for pancreatic polypeptide, and PYY encodes for 
peptide YY. Um, both of these are appetite hormones, and they also interact with another NPY, which is neuropeptide Y, um, in the gut-brain axis, and they affect both food intake and appetite control. So let's add this new knowledge to our roadmap here, saying that chromosome 12 and 13 are affecting IRX3. And then there's something with this set of um, hormones that are expressed in the gut-brain axis, the PPY, PYY, NPY, which all interact with each other in a very complex manner. So next, I want to understand um, what's the re relationship with IRX3? So first, let's look at chromosome 12, where we're interested in. And as you can see, for PPY expression, um, there is a peak above significance threshold for chromosome 12. But when I condition on the effects of IRX3, so I take out the effects of IRX3, you can see that the peak decreases below significance threshold to essentially zero. And then looking at the other way around, um, the peak on IRX3 for chromosome 12 does not have much of a change when I condition on the effects of PPY. So PPY isn't really influencing IRX3. So what I can conclude from this set of figures is that IRX3 is influencing the expression of PPY. So that allows me to draw this nice arrow from IRX3 to PPY. So then looking at PYY, um, something very similar occurs where IRX3 is um, causing the peak on chromosome 12 for PYY to decrease, whereas there's little to no change the other way around. So I can also conclude that IRX3 is upstream of PYY. So that allows me to draw this nice arrow of IRX3 influencing PYY expression. So just let's talk about what we've learned so far. Um, so what's already what was already known before I started the study was that the introns of FTO are influencing IRX3 expression. And what I learned is that there's something on chromosomes 12 and 13 that are also influencing IRX3 expression. And then IRX3 is involved with these three genes that encode for appetite hormones and are involved in the gut-brain axis. And IRX3 is upstream to this set of genes. And these genes are all implicated in the gut-brain axis and they all interact with one another. So there's some effects between the hypothalamus and the pancreas. And what happens next is that this gut-brain axis is then having an effect on energy homeostasis, specifically how the body takes in energy. So what we've found in this study is that IRX3 is an intermediate in the regulation of these neuropeptides in the gut-brain axis, which is then influencing energy intake and energy expenditure. So what's the next step for this study? Um, so all of this was done through statistical analysis. So what's next is to take my new knowledge that I've found and conduct studies in vivo, so with the mice, and test out this role of IRX3 as um, an intermediate in the regulation of these neuropeptides. And if this works out, then hey, we found new genes for targeted gene therapy, so then we can develop new therapies to deal with the growing obesity epidemic. And maybe we can develop some new treatments and um, prevent prevention me um, measures. So these are my references, and I'd like to thank Gary Churchill and Susan McClatchy, uh, my mentors, for their wonderful guidance, and thank you to the Jackson Laboratory Summer Student Program for providing this incredible research experience. And I'd also like to thank the J.B. Murphy Endowment for their generous support in making all of this possible.